Yes, please hit record. Okay, perfect. For those okay. that miss this presentation or want to look back on it because it's such great information, I'll be posting it to our um, Summit Series Present YouTube. So I'll send that out via email. Thank you, appreciate James. Go ahead. It. Yeah, no problem. So I appreciate everyone spending a little bit of time um, with me tonight. And, and you know, uh, I, was, I was sharing earlier, my sister, Natalie, my youngest sister has intellectual disabilities, is a Summit uh, alumni. She did two summers uh, and had a, had a lot of fun and um, we're working on independent living now. So, you know, I'm going to be really focusing in the next hour, uh, hour and a half on maximizing benefits and services. Originally in preparation for this, I was focusing mainly on New York, but I just learned there are some um, some families that are outside of New York. So I'll make sure to differentiate between federal benefits and then state benefits. And a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about are in fact federal. So should still be uh, beneficial for those if you do live out of the, the area. So on an introductory note, it's James Trailer, not like the singer, James Taylor, so no, no music jokes. Uh, and it's spelled a little differently than the mobile home. Um, and uh, we have a firm, we're based in upstate New York, uh, in the Rochester area, but we work across uh, the state and the country with families that have a family member with a disability. Um, I'm the former chair of Governor Cuomo's Developmental Disability Planning Council, uh, and we have um, our, our clients tend to be families that uh, want uh, their child to live in an independent uh, fashion with a lot of supports and are willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. So, um, you know, we've done everything from set up uh, 120 houses across the state from Brooklyn and Manhattan all the way to Sag Harbor, Long Island, um, where the family owns a property and rents it back to the child with a disability and we push in supports as needed to make that happen. Um, so there's, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that uh, we've seen over the years and hopefully can, can share the common denominator uh, for a lot of our, our work and our clients is that they uh, parents are confused about all the different supports and services that exist, and they don't know really where to turn because they find that no one really seems to have everything in one place. There may be an estate planning attorney that understands a little bit. You may have a medical uh, social worker or, or a, a Medicaid care coordinator or school officials, or you attend a webinar put on by a you know, a, a camp for individuals with disabilities. So it's, it's a little bit piecemeal. And, and uh, the reason for that is, um, you know, people that work in the, in the trust in the state world don't really know a lot about public benefits that were designed for people out of below the poverty level. You know, school officials don't know very much about money and trust. Um, you know, housing navigators or folks in the social services space don't necessarily know how you integrate private resources with public dollars. So everyone's kind of pointing their fingers saying, well, I don't know, talk to this person. And it's very overwhelming and confusing for families. So hopefully uh, after today, you'll, uh, you'll have a leg up on all those people. So um, uh, I do have the chat box open. So if you want to pepper me with questions as we go, I'm, I'm pretty light on my feet and, you know, we can, we can do it that way. So um, Important tax and legal disclosure, please don't watch this presentation and go buy Apple stock. Uh, we're not really gonna be touching on that, but we are gonna touch briefly on, on some things that tiptoe up to the line of uh, giving tax advice. So I, I really need to send my three-year-old to college one day and I can't afford a, a frivolous lawsuit. So please don't sue me after this presentation. Um, okay, so why is it important to plan? You know, from our vantage point, there are significant benefits that exist you just have to go find them and then find out if your family or your, your family member is, is in fact eligible. You know, in New York, we have a program called self-directed services, which is the monetization of Medicaid uh, that allows for certain families, you know, upwards of $130,000 a year for their loved one with a disability, as long as they meet the definition of disability as defined by, by New York State. Um, <clears throat> but for those outside of New York, you know, there's the Social Security Administration, there's the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, which oversees Medicaid and Medicare. You know, there are, um, you know, there's the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, or if you're in, if you're in other states other than New York, there's your state's, uh, you know, disability service organization, uh, which is uh, the common denominator is they're all funded usually through Medicaid. So, um, the, the, the good news is that if you tend to live in the uh, northeast part of the country um, in a high tax state, there tends to be a very robust 
social safety net and, and, and programs for individuals with disabilities. If you happen to live essentially, and if you look at a map of the Civil War, if you live in the South or the, you know, on the Confederate side, uh, there, there are, are fundamental differences in, in how those states view their citizens. And if you are someone who uh, is unable to financially provide for yourself, then oftentimes a lot of supports are provided through the state tax dollars that that state charges and then the services they deliver through those tax dollars. So there's a direct correlation. States that are good for retirement are bad if you have a disability and vice versa. So, um, you know, so I'm glad you guys are attending because it takes a lot of time to understand how all these things fit together and how you can braid services together to, to live truly independent, especially if you live in a high cost part of the state. So, so in, in my world, you know, you can rent an apartment for $1,200, $1,500 a month. My sister lives in Queens and she pays $3,500 a month for an apartment that is uh, not very big. So, you know, if you're a person with a disability and, and maybe you're employed, but maybe you're underemployed, you know, living in, in, in uh, Midtown Manhattan can be, can be tough. Uh, can be really tough. So our goal is to, to try to braid together all sorts of services to uh, make, uh, make it you know, as easy as possible. Uh, so there's a question that came through about applying for the social security waiver. And I've been told that my daughter has to fail at several jobs in order to prove that she's unable to support herself. So a couple of things. So I'm not, not sure of anything called a social security waiver. There, there is a supplemental security income, which I'm going to get into right now. Uh, which would be through the Social Security Administration. There's also something called Social Security Disability. So both SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and Social Security Disability Insurance use the exact same definition of disability. What you may be referring to is if, um, if your daughter does not have a significant disability in which the Social Security Administra its Administration can take a position that they feel that she can't maintain competitive employment, which they define as making more than $1,350 gross per month. That's their definition of employment. Now there's exceptions to that, but that's their definition. So if, if, if they feel that the medical data you've submitted does not indicate that, that she could not make more than that, then sometimes they will take the position that they'd like her to attempt to obtain a job and then potentially fail, or what I prefer is to have some type of workplace evaluation. So in New York, we have Access VR, the New York State Vocational and Rehabilitative Agency. Depending on which state you live in, there's, there's a comparable federally funded vocational program that will do an evaluation to determine employment readiness. And if that evaluation determines that you know, your daughter is unable to maintain competitive employment, Social Security will accept that without her having to fail uh, prior. Um, so just so you're clear. So there, I'm sure there's also private um, employment professionals that would also do that evaluation. You know, the, with, with the state vocational rehabilitative agency, there won't be a fee. It's, it's federally funded. You know, obviously going to a private practitioner, there, there, may, be, there may be a fee in, involved. But so it's not necessarily true that you have to fail. But there has to be, you know, when you're applying for a social security benefit, you can't, it's not an unemployment benefit, right? It's a social security. So in order to get supplemental security income, you have to meet the same definition of disability as social security disability, which is unable to perform the primary duties of an occupation due to a sickness or injury that is expected to last more than 13 months or result in death. Uh, and they define competitive employment as being $1,350 gross per month. So if your child is just, you know, they're, they're dealing with anxiety, um, but that anxiety hasn't been diagnosed to such a, an extent that there's, or there hasn't been a medical incident such as an inpatient hospitalization due to that anxiety, anxiety in of itself may not be severe enough to meet the definition of disability. So, um, so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's numerous factors that are at play. Um, you know, part of some of the work that we do is, is apply for social security for, for clients. Now that's not a standalone service. We kind of do it as a, a loss leader, as a value add, but, um, but, but so we're very familiar. And if we have time, I can get into some of the more technical aspects of, of that. 
Um, and so just so you're clear, I see that you're in Pennsylvania. The rules for supplemental security income and social security disability are the same because I'm sorry, in Pennsylvania as they are as New York because they are a federal benefit. So they're gonna be the same across the board unless you live in Puerto Rico, in which case they just approve 93% of everyone that applies. So that's, that's a little different, but Pennsylvania is different than Puerto Rico. Um, I'm gonna come back to the ABLE counts and, and uh, supplemental needs stress because you're jumping ahead, but, but uh, VG, you know, we'll get there, I promise. So the way I think about benefits uh, that makes sense in, in my head is I think of benefits that are out there that provide financial support. And then I think of benefits that provide programs, services, and healthcare. I draw a line between those two, and then and and depending on which what you're looking to obtain, it, it's sometimes helpful to think of things as all right. Is this going to provide money, or is this going to provide a service? Okay, and 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 that's that's I think I find somewhat helpful. So, as I was explaining, supplemental security income (SSI) and Social Security Disability Insurance (SSDI) are funded through the payroll tax, uh, the FICA tax, and so all of us every time we earn a paycheck or pay FICA, uh, we are paying into social security system. So if all of us were to uh, become disabled and using the definition I used, and we had no assets, no you know, assets um, below $2,000, and we had very little work history, we could apply for SSI. So SSI, we used to call it in the 90s, we used to call it welfare. Uh, it's, we don't call it that anymore. It's, it, it's called supplemental security income, but it is, is a social security benefit for those that have not yet paid into the system. They have not become vested in the social security disability system, and they have limited means, $2,000. That number hasn't changed in over 30 years. It's, it's personally, I find it insulting um, because the benefit itself is more than tripled in those 30 years, but the amount of resources you're, you're allowed to have is, is not has not changed during that period. So it's, as an advocate, I, I get a little frustrated at that. Um, and by the way, as I, as I hear background noise from some of you, I'm just, I'm just muting you. So use the chat box if you wouldn't mind. So SSI and SSDI use the exact same definition of disability. It's just SSI is for those that do not have work history and SSDI is for those that do have work history. So if you were to log on, if you're of working age and you were to log on to the social security website on ssa.gov, and they're going to ask you all sorts of security questions. And you were to you've you've worked at some point in your life. You're gonna you're gonna find that you may be vested in the social security system, and you there'd be a certain dollar amount that you'd be eligible for. Uh, if you've been a high earner, it's a maximum of three thousand three hundred and forty five dollars per month. Um, a lot of the families we're working with, the, the young adults, you know, aren't going to get that type of of uh, benefit. However, you know, it doesn't take a lot to get a social security benefit, and in fact lower wage earners as a percentage of their income actually get a higher social security benefit. You know, so if someone making a million dollars a year gets $3,345, someone making $50,000 a year is likely going to get like $2,800. So it's kind of interesting how they, they tier the benefit. Um, there's a benefit called childhood disability, uh, also child in care. So these are two social security benefits you've probably never heard of because they don't appear on your statement and no one like brings them up at cocktail parties. It's like, oh, you heard about childhood disability? It says no one. Um, so what it is, is childhood disability is a social security benefit for a child that has a disability that occurred prior to 22 and the parent is eligible for social security. So as, um, as far as I know, there's only three ways that happens. Either the parent dies, which isn't fun, they become permanently disabled themselves, also not fun, or a lot more fun, they retire and file for social security retirement benefits. So death, disability, retirement may trigger a social security benefit for your child. So when I say that child, it could be adopted child, it could be grandchild that was legally adopted, it could be natural child, the child is, is somewhat of a broad definition. Um, but you have to be able to connect your social security record to theirs. So, so we work with some families that have adopted multiple children or adopted a grandchild due to circumstances, and uh, that would count too. So using simple math, if my benefit's 3000 my child would be eligible for 50% of that or $1,500 once I begin getting my $3,000 benefit. So the way they calculate the benefit is, is if you're born after 1960, 
they look at the amount you would be eligible for at age 67. So if you log on, look at your statement, you were born after 1960, look at how much you'd get at 67 and 50% of that is what your child would get if you were disabled or if you uh, retire and collect your benefit. If you pass away and they meet the definition of disability, it's not 50%, it's actually 75%. So it's, um, you know, it's fairly significant. We have some clients that are getting $2,400 a month because their parent passed away and they have autism or you know, some, some disability and, and, and they meet the social security definition of disability. So that's childhood disability. What child and care is, is it's the exact same benefit, but it's paid to the caregiver of that child. So we work with a lot of families that for a variety of reasons, one parent, if there are two parents, but one parent had to make a career sacrifice uh, given the, the needs of, of their child. And I, uh, my heart goes out to those families because it's, it's, it's hard um, and it's not fair. Um, but inevitably that parent, if they did make that career sacrifice, won't have as robust a social security work history as maybe the other working parent. So what this benefit is designed for is to protect that non-working parent and provide a benefit for them that has no impact on their own benefit. So it, it doesn't stack on top. It's if it's larger, they would get whichever is, is higher. But we can have a situation for uh, where one parent retires, the child starts getting a benefit, and then the parent, the other parent starts getting a benefit. And that would continue until that parent elects their own social security. So I realize that's a little bit technical, but my goal for today is simply to raise your awareness. Obviously, I, I can't teach you how to ride a bike at a seminar. Um, you know, I can't tell you to teach you to understand a 40,000 page program. That's how long the field manual is. It's over 40,000 pages. Can't get you to understand all of that in an hour. But what I want you to understand is SSI is social security for those that don't have a work history and have very little means. SSDI, same definition for, for people that have paid in. Childhood disability is a benefit off of your working record that your child may be eligible for. And child and care is a benefit off of your working record that your spouse may be eligible for. Okay. doesn't require that the child be living in the home. Uh, we've been able to secure this benefit for kids that are living in group homes, um, out of state. They, the, the, the parent just has to have material interest and, and involvement in that child's life, um, which is, uh, I think, a fairly loose definition. So ISS is a New York State specific program. It's a, it's a housing subsidy that is paid to help an, an individual afford uh, either home ownership or market rent. Uh, many other states in the Northeast, Pennsylvania, um, well, it's not Northeast, uh, but uh, Illinois has this, uh, New Jersey has this, Connecticut has this. Uh, Connecticut's a little tricky to get, but it does exist. And it's, it's additional money above and beyond the social security that can go to help an individual afford housing. So some of the work we do, have a family, buy a, buy a property, set up a lease, rent it back to their child with a disability and charge them full market rent. Child gets social security, child gets this housing subsidy, parent takes that money, pays the mortgage. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, we've done uh, about 120 of those across the state. Uh, SNAP, also federal. So whether you're in Pennsylvania, Vermont, New York, New Hampshire, it doesn't matter, federal. Uh, SNAP stands for the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, otherwise known as food stamps. Um, if someone's on supplemental security income, typically they should be able to get the maximum amount of SNAP. And I'll talk about how you get the maximum amount, uh, which would be $250 per month until uh, they update it for inflation. And that'll be a big, big boost this year. Um, there's something called HEAP, which is the Home Energy Assistance Program, also federal. Uh, this helps you afford um, energy costs, uh, primarily in the winter. So the way it works is the money, if you're approved, goes directly from the state. So it's federal, but it's administered by the states, goes directly from the state to the energy company. So your child, if the utility bill is in their name, or if they're renting from you and contributing towards household utilities, would get a lower utility bill. So um, it ranges $35 up to 2000. So some of our clients that live on Long Island that have oil heat, we're paying a lot of money this winter for heat. Uh, some of our clients were getting about $2,000 towards their, their oil heat, which is pretty cool. 
Um, another New York state specific program, but it is in, in, in several other states, uh, Vermont has it, I believe New Hampshire has it called self-direction. So what that is, is it's the monetization of Medicaid where the individual gets a budget, that budget is portable and the money follows the person. So money that was originally intended for state run institutions is diverted for the individual then live in, and work and, and, and uh, be a part of the community. So you can use that money to pay for classes, staff, housing, um, utilities, a variety of other things. So for my New Yorkers on the call, uh, you know, April 15th is coming, got to pay a bunch of taxes. This is what we get for our taxes. So some would argue it's worth it. You know, but at any rate. Um, all right, on the, on the healthcare and services side, the big one is Medicaid. So the reason the big one is Medicaid is Medicaid at its core is a health insurance program for people at or below the federal poverty level. Due to the expansion of the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, we've dramatically changed the income and asset rules for, for an individual to qualify for Medicaid. But many programs that serve people with disabilities, regardless of the state you live in, are tethered to the state Medicaid program, which creates a tremendous, uh, it creates this kind of hypocritical situation where a program that was designed for people at the poverty level is the only way you can get certain adult-based disability services. So we have some clients that have publicly traded companies and are very affluent and have to stand in line and get their kids on Medicaid simply because the program that is a really good fit for them doesn't take cash. They'd gladly take a donation, but it's not pay for service or fee for service. And they only are set up to accept Medicaid dollars. So that's a little silly, but it's the game we all have to play. So there's different ways you can get Medicaid. One is you get supplemental security income. If you're on SSI, so you go through the federal social security portal, so to speak, and you're approved for SSI, you're automatically enrolled in Medicaid, whether you want it or not. So if you're covered under a group health insurance program through, for example, a parent, well, you just picked up a secondary health insurance plan. The reason that's important is in some states, you can actually get Medicaid to then help pay that health insurance plan for the parents, which is kind of neat. Um, or you simply have two insurance plans. So many of us have high deductible health plans now. So your child may have um, the health insurance through you uh, and then Medicaid as a secondary insurer, which is neat because if they go to the doctor and the doctor accepts Medicaid and they're within the deductible, they have a thousand dollar bill, Medicaid pays it and accounts towards the deductible, which is pretty slick. You also have state waiver programs. So waivers are the specific state asking to take dollars that used to go to big state-run institutions or hospitals, think nursing homes, and it waives that funding to then be spent in the home and community. So in states like New York and New Jersey and Vermont, it's called the Home and Community-Based Services Waiver, HCBS Waiver. Uh, fancy term is the 1115 waiver, that's the federal code. But they also have different waivers. So if a child has a traumatic brain injury, many states have specific brain injury waivers. If a child is medically frail, which is probably not this group, but um, there are things called the children's waiver, the care at home waiver. Uh, different states are messing around with how they serve seniors and the, the nursing home population to avoid getting them into a nursing home. So there's, there's different waivers out there that provide disability services. And so they're state specific, but they're all, the common denominator of everyone on the call is that in order to get a state waiver, you must have Medicaid, which means that you may need to jump through various financial hoops in order to um, obtain that Medicaid. Uh, there's Medicare. So Medicare is the federal health insurance program that's available for everyone that is 65 or older, or that has been on social security disability insurance for two years. So many of my clients, um, their kids go on social security disability or the parent retires and they go on social security um, off of the parent's record. And after two years, they get automatically enrolled in Medicare, which is pretty cool. So it's kind of funny. You get like a 24 year old getting AARP solicitations in the mail. It's, it's, just throw them away, but um, it's pretty neat. And it's the same Medicare that anyone 
can use. So, so this is federal. So if, if you're on social security disability, childhood disability, uh, two years later, you get Medicare. So um, I got all excited. I stopped looking at the chat box and I see there's a whole bunch of questions. So I'm going to blow through a couple questions. I'm going to come back to the able and special needs trust question. I, I, I promise. Um, is New Jersey the same as New York and Pennsylvania? So it depends. So on this page, SSI, SSDI, Childhood Disability, Child and Care, SNAP, HEAP, Medicaid, many of the waivers, Medicare are all the same in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania. The difference, ISS, the housing subsidy, self-direction, the Department of Health Benefits, CDPAP, that's the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program. That's a New York State specific program, but both New Jersey and Pennsylvania have similar programs there, but they're called something different. They're home healthcare programs. Um, and then Access VR, uh, that is also in each state, but each state calls it something different. That's the State Vocational and Rehabilitative Agency. It's the, the disability employment organization for the state. So all the states call them slightly different things, but they're federally funded. So each state has them. They just may call it something else. So in New York, it's called Access VR. So um, that was that question. Um, so Kim, do we help people apply for SSI in New Jersey? Um, you know, it, it's really something we do for existing clients that are typically in New York. You know, I, I'm, uh, we do have clients that are in New Jersey, but I would say our real value proposition is for families living living in New York, or at least the child being in New York. Some of our clients live in Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New Jersey, but the child wants to end up in New York, and then we can definitely work with the people. Um, there was a question, is the parent's benefit reduced by 50% for the child? Great question, and no. This is on top of the parent. So back to my example, if my social security benefit is going to be three grand, and I file for benefits, and my child meets the definition of disability, they're going to get $1,500, and it has no impact on my benefit. Now, if I have seven kids with disabilities, God bless you, they don't all get 50%. There is a cap. So the, the very last number on your social security statement will say total family benefits. So the aggregate of all the other people plus your own benefit cannot exceed that number. So if that cap was say 6,000 and I had four kids with autism, my own benefits three grand, they don't all get 1,500. They're gonna split as a group the remaining $3,000. So they would get slightly less, but that's, that's how that works. So great, great question. Um, my disabled daughter is set to inherit an IRA from a grandparent. Should I change it so that she has no assets in her name? Not supposed to talk about these things, guys. But um, so I don't know all the situations. What I can tell you is if, Mary, you live in New York, in New York, an IRA is an exempt resource for Medicaid. It is, however, a resource for supplemental security income. So it depends on what benefits your family member is receiving. If they're on Medicaid, they could have a million dollar IRA and keep the Medicaid. Now, Medicaid won't tell you that because they don't like when people have a million dollars, uh, but um, it is an exempt resource. And if you need guidance, uh, I'd be happy to walk you through that. Um, until what age can the child claim this benefit? So back to the ages here, and that's a great question. So it, at SSI, prior to the child turning 18, Social Security goes off of income and assets of the family. So most of our clients do not qualify for SSI because the, because their assets and income are just too high. Upon turning 18, eligibility for SSI is based on the income and assets of the child. So for many families, we move some stuff around and make the child eligible, uh, obviously legally and so forth. And that benefit would continue until either the child themselves loses it because they went over $2,000, made too much money, or no longer disabled, got married. There's a variety of different scenarios. Or they become vested in the Social Security Disability System by virtue of their earnings and work, or they qualify for a benefit off of their parents' record, in which case those benefits will continue for the rest of their life unless they worked so much that they were no longer deemed to be disabled. They have a disability, but by virtue of the earnings, if you're making hundred grand a year, you're not 
disabled under the social security rules. Um, so that benefit would continue uh, for the rest of their life, as long as they maintain the definition of disability. So what I said for, us, for either Stephen or Stephanie, I, I, your name's cutting off. What if you were born before 1960? So <clears throat> if you're born at 1950, your social security retirement age is 66. 1960 is 67. If you're born in say 56, I think it's 66 and six months. So it, 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 it slowly phased in, in those 10 years to, to go from 66 to 67. And so whatever it says on your statement, your full retirement benefit is, which is gonna be either 66, 67 or some months in between, your family member may, may being the operative word, be eligible for 50% of that number whenever you file. Um, when you say child, you mean under 18. No, Pam, when I, when I say child, I'm just meaning child in general. It could be an adult child. Um, so, so let's just go through a hypothetical back to this childhood disability benefit. So if the parents are 67, I'm assuming, unless you got started a little late in life, your, your child is, is uh, over 18, okay? Shouldn't make these assumptions. This is how I get in trouble. I'm sorry, we're recording this. But at any rate, when I'm using the term child, I simply mean child. It could be adult child, young child, it doesn't matter, it's just child. So social security, when they go after, when you go after these benefits, is gonna wanna see a birth certificate or adoption papers. And they just wanna connect your social security record to the, the child's, whether that child is 50, or 40 or 18. Um, it's a good question. What is the name of the housing program? So I, uh, it's individual supports and services. So that's the standalone benefit, again, in New York. Uh, and it, it also can be part of the self-direction program that's administered through the New York State Office of Persons with Developmental Disabilities, OPWDD. Um, my daughter's worked part-time for the past six months. Should we apply for SSD for her? So Ellen, if your daughter is getting SSI already, you don't apply for SSD. You simply pay FICA tax, and eventually she's going to become vested in the SSD program, and Social Security will catch up, and then they will pay her a retroactive benefit when she vested and earned enough credits. So depending on how old your daughter is, um, uh, if she was disabled before 24, she needs six credits, uh, and you get a credit at about $1,500 or so of wages. And then from that point forward, every year you get older, you add two credits. So by the time you're 30, you need, um, you need 20 credits or five years. I'm sorry, 20 credits would be four years worth of work history. Five years worth of work history. Sorry about that. It's the end of the day. Um, good, good question. Can the ISS money from your state be used for a group home in another state? No, Kim. Uh, these are state specific benefits. So the money follows the person, but that money stops at the state border. And the reason for that is Medicaid is funded in part by that state. So there are certain exceptions to that rule that likely don't apply here. So we have some clients that are in out of state residential placements because their disability was so significant that their state said they couldn't support them safely. That's the exception. But if you're going to summit camp, probably don't have a child that's in an out of state residential placement. Um, what documents are needed to prove disability? My son was diagnosed at seven with autism. He's now 17. So again, uh, Karima, if your child is in New York state, um, you would engage one of the, when, and you say prove disability, it's, are you proving disability to the social security administration? Because they have their set of documents that they're gonna wanna see? Or are you proving disability of the Office for Persons with Developmental Disabilities in New York or, or your disability service organization? So in general, they're gonna wanna see school records, IEPs. They're gonna wanna see medical records. Um, they're gonna wanna see something saying that they have a qualifying diagnosis. So they're gonna want a doctor to take a position Typically, ADHD doesn't prevent someone from working. Uh, I have a diagnosis of ADHD, um, and many of our uh, many of you may have an ADHD diagnosis. Um, so, in of itself, 
ADHD doesn't necessarily get you anywhere. It's, is it so significant that it prevents someone from working? Or is it so pervasive that it uh, falls under the umbrella of an intellectual or developmental disability? So typically it would be the autism that you would be exploring, in which case, all of these systems are not going to want this informal autism, be like, yeah, it looks like autism. They're going to want something like the ADOS assessment, the autism diagnostic screening for or whatever it is now. They're going to want a formal clinical autism diagnosis in order to meet uh, the definition of disability. Um, so IEPs, medical records, um, sometimes prescription records, work history in certain cases, if you're going after social security, they may want to see child's uh, work history. Uh, can we get slides for this presentation? It's a lot. Uh, I believe the benefit or the, the presentation is going to be recorded. Um, so I don't typically send out the slides. And the reason is all these benefits are subject to change at the whim of the United States government. So I'm really scared of giving you information. You're like, that guy, James Trailer said I was going to get this. And the laws change. And I didn't update you because I didn't know you had my slides. So I'm a little hesitant to do that. Um, how do you go about obtaining the, max, obtaining the max for SSI for my son? I believe it's 750 per month. So, so um, if that's either Michelle or Michael, again, I can't see. So for SSI, I'll get into that in on the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna stop there because you guys continuing to go with questions. And if I keep going, which is great, I love this. I'm not gonna get through maximizing benefits. I just went over what benefits there are. So let's do that. Maximizing resources for the, woman who just asked, how do I get the maximum uh, SSI benefit? So in, in a situation where your child is eligible for SSI, SSI is designed to pay for food and shelter. So Social Security takes the absurd position that if your child doesn't pay for rent and doesn't pay for food, then they don't deserve the full SSI benefit. Conversely, if they're living in a situation where they couldn't possibly afford the rent because it's say $2,000 and they're only getting 928, they also reduce the SSI because they're saying you couldn't afford that. You're obviously getting help from someone else. So the magic number tends to be somewhere between 550 and $650 for rent. Doesn't matter if you live in midtown Manhattan, you tell social security you're charging your child 550, $650 for rent. And if they give you a hard time, Tell them you're not the landlord. I set the rent around here, lady. So that's what it is. And there's nothing they can do about it because that's what you set the rent at. It's, you know, the, sometimes these social security officials try to like give you attitude, but, you know, they give people SSI, whether you live in Biloxi, Mississippi or Manhattan, it's the same number, slight difference for state benefits, but, you know, 50 bucks. So, so don't let them bully you into saying, well, how could you, could you really afford that? It's none of their business because that's, you know, you're the landlord, you set the rent. So by charging for lodging and by saying that your rent does not include food, Social Security will raise the amount of SSI that they're receiving simply by charging rent. Also, don't let the Social Security officials give you tax advice. You too can be like Donald Trump and not pay any income tax on your rental properties. So if you have expenses to offset the rent, then you're good. So most of us have expenses. And so because SSI beneficiaries don't pay federal tax anyway, it would be up to you to disclose it. And if you do disclose it, you have the ability to offset it with rental expenses. So, so don't let them give you that crap. Um, strategically electing social security benefits. So as I mentioned earlier, some of you may have realized there may be a connection between your decision to file for social security and your child's social security. So um, we would advise you to work with someone who really understands social security and can guide you on the impact of your decision to elect benefits and what it's gonna to do to your child. Because for some of our clients, um, you know, when we add up the three, if there's a married couple with one kid on, that has a disability, for some of our clients, we're getting 70, 80,000 a year in social security by doing this right. So um, obviously it's dependent on your work history and, and a variety of other factors, but but it, it's, it's not an insignificant number if, if you, you um, understand how these benefits all connect. So you wanna be strategic in, in electing and you wanna find out if your child meets the definition of disability because that's a lot of money to leave on the table. And, and so some, some of you may have kids that they simply, I hate this term, but they're too high functioning. Social security doesn't consider them to have a disability. 
then it may not apply. But, but for many, if your child is on SSI, typically they're gonna meet the definition or, or if they're on SSD, uh, they may meet the definition uh, that Social Security is looking, looking for. For those of you in New York, um, that their child is eligible for the Office of Persons with Developmental Disabilities. There's a benefit that you, uh, I assume, are aware of, but it's called self-directed services. It is truly one of the most amazing things in the state of New York because it allows the monetization of Medicaid and allows someone to take that money and go out and pay for a camp like Summit Camp <laughs> to, to pay for uh, other camps to, to, to pay rent, to pay for transportation, to pay for clothing, to pay for a Wi-Fi bill or a cell phone. It's, it's pretty special. And, um, you know, we find some families just either aren't aware of it or have been told not to apply. And I just think that's foolish because we spend in New York one out of three tax dollars on Medicaid. So, you know, pay taxes, get the benefit. Um, again, a New York benefit but then the federal rule applies to everyone. Some uh, individuals need assistance with activities of daily living. And there is uh, a program called the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program that will pay uh, to have someone help the child you know, with those things, eating, dressing, bathing, toileting, transferring. So it doesn't mean child can't shower at all. It's just like my sister would take a shower and she'd be in there for 30 minutes and she wouldn't wash her hair. And so she needs prompting. <laughs> <laughs> to say, Natalie, get back in there, wash your hair. That means she can't shower independently because otherwise, nappy, gross hair. Um, so um, some people don't know of that, that program as well. So, so for many of us trying to figure out how do, we, how do we staff a house to provide a lot of supports for someone, we're crossing systems. We're using services through the New York State Department of Health as well as the Office for Persons with Developmental Disabilities. We're stacking them on top of each other. Now, the neat... Uh, uh, IRS ruling that applies to all states is if, if they're uh, under IRS ruling 2014-7, which is not fun to say, it's just Google 2014-7. Um, if a staff person is getting paid through Medicaid to provide care and they live with the person they support, 100% of their wages are federally and state tax free. So this is a federal rule that comes from the IRS. So if you in New York, self-direction CDPAP fall under these rules. If you live in other states, whatever way that your state provides care or, or, or services to an individual with disability, if that caregiver lives with the individual with disability, 100% of the wages are tax-free. So what's amazing about that is we have all sorts of shared living situations that we help facilitate across the state. You can pay someone 50 grand cover all of their living expenses, their food, their utilities, and all of that is tax-free. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So like my sister doesn't need someone to wipe her bottom. She just needs someone to remind her to lock the front door because she's notorious for not doing that. Or like she'll be watching her iPhone and walk away from the stove while it's on. That's not safe. So she, she just needs someone to kind of be there, like a roommate with like added responsibilities. That's a live-in caregiver. And, and if this individual is getting paid through the state to do that, 100% tax-free. So it's pretty cool. All right. I said I'd get to the building up resources. So there are lots of tools. So I, I mentioned many of these benefits are dependent on income and assets, but there's all sorts of ways to exceed the asset rules. So there are these, these really cool tools that are available in most states called ABLE accounts. ABLE stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience, a little cheesy name, but with the Stephen Beck ABLE account. Um, what they are is they're an expansion on the 529 College Savings Plan. So it allows you to save $16,000 a year if you're working a little bit more than that. And that money, it, once it goes into the ABLE account, could be invested and grow tax-free. It can come out tax-free if you spend it on the person with a disability for virtually anything. And most importantly, it doesn't count as an asset for Social Security and or Medicaid. The other cool thing is it belongs to the person with a disability. So let's say they're working, they wanna to save to get ahead, but they're on SSI. They're not allowed to have more than $2,000. Well, they could put all their wages into their ABLE account and save well in excess of $2,000. So it's a very, very neat tool that is relatively new in New York. We adopted the law in 2017. Uh, other states were a little bit further. Ohio and Pennsylvania actually got out in front and were, I think, 20. 14 or 2015, um, but, but very cool tools. 
Um, there's also these tools called supplemental needs trusts, uh, which are estate planning tools uh, to put uh, more significant assets aside for an individual with a disability. Typically, we use them in our planning for after the parents die as a way to place resources into a trust that doesn't impact the benefits they're receiving. So there was an earlier question. Can you explain that able accounts and supplemental, first party supplemental needs trusts go back to the state when the child dies? I'm gonna try and find that question. Uh, it depends on the state uh, for able accounts. So in New York, it does. It goes back to the state after the child dies. Um, and so the question was, I'm told able accounts and first party special needs trusts need to reimburse Medicaid for any leftover funds. How do we find out what Medicaid will charge? So you, you can ask, you can ask for an accounting through the Department of Social Services for how much they have spent on your child. So they won't get super excited about having to do that work, but, but you are entitled to that as a taxpayer and as a Medicaid recipient. And, and we've actually, in certain cases, terminated Medicaid, um, private paid for something and then reinstated Medicaid. Um, so, and, and we did that after getting an accounting. So you can absolutely do it. Uh, do they show a running total of how much the first party trust will, oh, they, they, they by law, they have to track it and you are entitled to, to find out what it is. Um, and it, to the extent the trust has more assets in it after the death of your child, they can only recoup what was spent. And they do it with uh, present value dollars. So if they spent a dollar in 1980, it's gonna be a dollar, even if your child dies in 2050. So um, they don't index it for inflation. So that actually works to your benefit. So take okay, a question. Uh, let me get back to... Um, my son got Medicaid through OPWD, no clue how to use it. Where do I find more, more info on Medicaid? Uh, that is not actually an uh, unsurprising uh, question. So um, I think that says, is it Mariana? Uh, again, I can't see everyone's full name. So you should have received a blue and white card through the Department of Social Services that says my benefits. That is your Medicaid card. Take that card to the pharmacy take it to your pediatrician or your primary care physician uh, for the child and give them the number. Uh, it is active health insurance right now. So if your child is covered under your plan, give them it to everyone else because now they have secondary insurance. So if you have co-pays, if you have deductibles and they take Medicaid, which any hospital by law has to take Medicaid, some of the private clinicians may not because they don't want to deal with the low reimbursement rates. Pharmacies typically do, but they do have a formulary of what drugs they cover. Um, sometimes certain name brands, they give you a hard time. But um, that's how you use it. Uh, where do you find more info on Medicaid? I'm supposed to tell you, you ask your care coordinator, but you know, eh. um, technically you can find information on the New York State Department of Health. Um, but I would just start with giving the number to anyone in the medical setting. Uh, and get in that habit and just have them enter it as a secondary insurance. Uh, that's the easiest way to start using it. Um, if you are presenting, we are not seeing the presentation. Is that, you're not seeing anything here? Can I, can someone unmute and just tell me? You're not seeing what I'm- We're not seeing see. anything. I'm not seeing any slides. We're seeing like, you. Yeah. No, nothing, no. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness gracious. I am the worst presenter of all time. There we go. You guys got to jump. Yeah. So did you not see this slide earlier? No. Oh, no. I'm really sorry, guys. Well, um, maybe I will send my slides then because I am the worst presenter of all time. And I thought I've been looking at the presentation this whole time. I didn't realize you weren't seeing what uh, I was covering. So this, this is a lot to follow then if you didn't have anything to reference. And I, I apologize for that. So um, Quick recap, because you know I just blew through this. Um, you know, SSI, SSDI, CDB, these are the maximum numbers. Um, individual sports services was a housing subsidy. SNAP was the $250 a month, that's the maximum. HEAP was between 35 and 2,000. And self-direction is 128,000. And then here are the healthcare and services. Um, again, I'll, I'll send this out now that you just can't use it against me if the laws change. And then maximizing resources, this is what I've been talking about. So charging for lodging, SSI beneficiaries, strategically electing when to file for benefits. There's the, the cross-system benefit. And now we're up to building up resources. So again, I'm, I really apologize. Um, thanks for finally letting me know in the chat, guys. You got you to stay on 
on top of things earlier. Um, but the good news is I do feel that we've been tackling a lot of questions. So I'm gonna go back to some of these questions. Um, so, holy cow, there's, there's some good ones here. Um, all right. Um, if you live in New York and receive services, I self, ISS self-direction and move to Pennsylvania, do those programs transfer? No, they do not. The only things that would transfer, if I go back a slide, would be, so if it's federal, so if it's SSI, SSDI, childhood disability, child and care, those would transfer. SNAP doesn't technically transfer, but if you were eligible in one state and you move to another, you just have to reapply, but you'll get it because uh, it's federally funded, but it's administered by the state. Uh, Medicaid would be, you'd have to reapply unless you're on SSI. So if you're on SSI, you just notify Social Security that you moved and then your Medicaid will transfer. If you're on Medicare, it'll transfer because it's federal. Department of Health Benefits and state waiver programs are state specific. Um, how do we find a Florida attorney specializing this? So Melanie, you may wanna look at the Special Needs Alliance or the Academy of Special Needs Planners. Those are two trade groups that um, I can't speak to the, the attorney you end up with, but at least that attorney uh, knows enough to attend continuing education on, on this type of topic. Um, I have a patient with terminal cancer. Her son with autism has been denied social security benefits on several occasions. Um, mom is undocumented, son is US citizen. That's a really tricky question. Um, you know, we do some pro bono work, but the problem is, um, you know, we're not a nonprofit. So a lot of our pro bono work are these type of presentations because we're spending usually 20 to 50 hours on a, on a file. So there might be some things I could help with, but, um, you know, we're just not at a place where we can take a ton of uh, pro bono work at this time, just with the, the volume of, of things we're doing. And I have six staff that I they get very upset if I don't, if I don't pay them. Um, so uh, so the, the follow-up question is I was referring to the childhood disability, the one where the parent dies, becomes disabled or retires until what age can the child claim that benefit? Uh, the answer is for the rest of that child's life until that child gets legally married or lost their status as has, having a disability, which would be by virtue of, of earnings. So if they had the benefit and then started making 50 grand a year, they're gonna lose the benefit because they made 50 grand a year. Um, so good question. After 18, will Social Security use the parent's income for eligibility if the child lives at home? No, uh, Karima, at 18, it's based on the child's income and the child's resources, parental income has nothing to do with anything. Um, what about survivor benefits for children with disabilities? So the way survivor benefits work is survivor benefits are paid to the child up until that child reaches 18 or 19 if still in high school. After 19, you just have to prove to Social Security that the child has a disability. And if, it, if Social Security agrees with you, then the benefits continue after 19. So sorry if that wasn't clear. Um, she doesn't have SSI yet. Oh, Ellen, she's 21. I would absolutely apply for SSI before 22 because that is a key benchmark. So if the disability occurs before 22, you leave open on the table the childhood disability benefits. If the disability occurs at say 30, we can't say that they were disabled as a child unless you can prove that the disability occurred before 22. So it, we've, we've been able to do that a couple of times but it takes like Down syndrome. It takes something that Social Security can't fight us. Although they do tell, ask us every year, like, do you still have Down syndrome? It's like, no, I didn't get the soap to wash it off. You know, but at any rate, that's... Um, do you have any advice for getting registered with OPWD for a child with autism? Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the process is you start with a care coordination organization. There's seven across the state. And then... Um, um, you know, you want to, if in order to get, if you're using autism as a diagnosis, um, the evaluations done by your local public school may not be enough because they, they need to be, uh, they need to be the clinical formal diagnosis. Now, the nice thing is if your child has autism, it says they have autism in the school records, OPWDD will pay for 
clinical evaluations to, to do the formal ADOS test. Now, it may be a, a year wait list to get them to pay for it. You could certainly go to a private clinician and get it faster, but um, uh, finances do not have to necessarily be a barrier to getting OPWDD. So that's, that's a good question. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to the presentation and then I'll pick up back at these questions because you guys are rapid firing these things. This is great. Um, again, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were reading the presentation this whole time. So building up resources is where we, where, where we stop. So the ABLE account, Supplemental Needs Trust are two tools that we use to build up resources. For those that are in New York and your child is on SSI, what's neat is there's the organization Access VR, the State Vocational and Rehabilitative Agency. If your child's on SSI, you can get tuition assistance through Access VR to pay for a credit bearing course. So we have clients that are at Cornell University or at NYU, they're at a community college. They're learning to a trade. They're learning to cut hair. They're learning to work with wood. They're learning to be a locksmith. And Access VR is paying up to the State University of New York, SUNY, tuition rate, $20,000 a year. It waives, by the child getting SSI, it waives household income and household resources, which is spectacular. So regardless of your personal financial situation, your child may be able to get assistance financially paying for, it's got to be credit bearing or credential. So it can't be auditing courses. It can't be, um, you know, just a transition program. It needs to be like open to the public, matriculated student, or, you know, uh, it needs to be a certificate program like being a, a locksmith or a welder. Um, but the state will pay, pay for that. And then SNAP, if someone has been approved for SNAP, um, the, the trick to maximizing it is, you want the rent that you're charging your child to not include utilities. So it's rent plus utilities. And um, the, the state, whichever state you live in, will typically bump it up to the maximum federal amount, which is uh, 250 bucks, which is pretty cool. All right, back to rapid firing uh, uh, answering questions. These benefits apply if the parent takes guardianship. Yes. So guardianship of the individual has no bearing at all on any of these benefits. The benefits follow the person, not their status of as a citizen or someone who has capacity. So we have many clients that chose guardianship uh, for their family. It was what's best for them and it's beyond the scope of today's presentation, but these benefits absolutely apply. Um, do you have any recommendations for individuals who are considered high functioning? You know, there are still a lot of programs and services that are out there. They may not be derived through social security, but for example, SNAP, HEAP and Medicaid don't necessarily require someone being eligible for the Office for Persons with Developmental Disabilities. So we have, we have a number of clients that are very high functioning. Uh, we have a client who now she has cerebral palsy. She works at Wegmans, which for those of you who don't know, export of Rochester, uh, greatest grocery store of all time. Uh, she works at Wegmans, she makes 100,000 a year. She's a million two in her 401k and she's on Medicaid. She has services in the home to help her live independently. So that's someone that extremely capable, but she does have a disability and is able to take advantage of a variety of these systems. So you just have to learn the rules. And, and if there's a program out there that would be beneficial, you know, if you have autism, but you're too high functioning for uh, social security, you can still get Medicaid and a variety of other supports and services. Um, you know, it just may require a different, a different path. Um, how do we find all these specialists in different areas of benefits and, and available? How do we pay them? You know, Alan, I don't have a good answer for how you find these people other than shameless self-promotion and you just hire us. Um, but I, you know, the problem, as I mentioned, is that this is just a really niche area of planning and a lot of people can't or don't want to spend the time to really understand everything. So, um, you know, uh, there are occasionally people, you know, attorneys or school counselors or folks that for whatever reason, usually a personal reason got into this space, but for many people, you know, it just takes attending presentations like this over and over again until you find someone that you're comfortable with working with. OPWD pays for camp, sports classes, music classes. So OPWD, Marion, um, if, someone is enrolled in that and gets self-direction can absolutely pay for camp, sports classes, music classes, 
Um, that is a textbook use of, of self-direction. Um, has anyone been able to use self-direction in New York to pay for Summit? Uh, Margaret, I don't see why not. We have lots of clients that have been able to use it for an out-of-state camp. Uh, we've had clients go skiing in Aspen, pay for the airfare and private ski lessons on the slopes. Can't pay for the skis though, but you can pay for the airfare and the, and the lessons. So if that's in Colorado, I don't see why Pennsylvania wouldn't be on the table. Um, so I think that that issue of being in Pennsylvania is specific to the fiscal intermediary that you have. And I believe that can be argued. Um, does, does New Jersey have a comparable program to self-directed services? Um, it does, uh, Patty, but I believe there is a waiting list. Um, there is a waiting list for it and they have a specific waiver. They have an autism waiver and uh, it's a slot based system in order to get some of these services. So I'm not an expert on all of the nuances of the New Jersey system, uh, but they do have something, but it's, whereas New York is not slot based, it's as long as you meet the definition, you can get the service. Uh, New Jersey has uh, caps the number of people that can go into the program. Um, Massachusetts, I believe does have something similar to self-direction, but again, they cap it. Um, and I'm, I'm not familiar with all of the rules. I'm sorry. Um, there you go. So <laughs> following uh, up to one of the questions, yes, Summit Camp has been successful in self-direction in certain cases. Um, so there you go. Oh, looks like they have a Manhattan address. Sneaky. I love the outside the box thinking. So there you go, that, that's a certain way. Can ABLE accounts be used for college? Absolutely. So the ABLE account is session? an expansion Good. of the 529 college savings plan. So as a 529 college savings plan, it can absolutely be used for college. Um, but what's great is it can be used for things outside of college, rent, food, college, computers, classes, um, clothing, uh, vacations, airfare, bus fare, MTA pass, Uber, Lyft, you name it. So it's, it's, I, uh, it's actually, in my opinion, superior to the 529 college savings plan. There's just a, a, a cap on the amount you can use to fund it on an annual basis. And for now, until 2025, you can actually roll money from a 529 plan into an ABLE account, um, which is pretty neat. So that's something to think of. Does Florida have an ABLE account? Yes. Or self-directed? No. No state income tax not a lot of services and there's a direct correlation. So it's good for retirees, bad for people with disabilities. Come on up to New York, <laughs> sorry. Usually it's the other way around. Who is the beneficiary of an ABLE account in New Jersey? So it, um, the, the, because the ABLE accounts are federal, the individual themselves is the owner and beneficiary. So the person with a disability, it's, they're the owner, they're the beneficiary, which is different with the 529 college savings plan. Typically the parents are the owner with a child being the beneficiary. So subtle difference, um, but that's, that's how that works. Um, is there a cap that can be contributed to the ABLE account? It's a tricky question. At $100,000, if someone is on SSI, you would lose your SSI. So you're still eligible for SSI. They would just suspend the payment until you drop below 100 grand. Many states have a, a higher cap. So like in New York, it's 520,000 is the cap. So each state, has slightly different caps. There is, um, there's the, the ABLE National Resource Center has a really cool tool to compare different states. I think it's ablenrc.org, uh, um, but just Google ABLE National Resource Center and you'll find they have a great tool for just fees, expenses, comparison of investment options, rules, super useful tool that you should, uh, should check out. If the child is covered under the parent's plan, is Medicaid always secondary? Yes, Medicaid is always the payer of last resort. Um, so what's neat about that and gets to my final maximizing resources question is in certain cases, if someone has a copay or co-insurance plan and the deductible is under $1,400 for an individual, $2,800 for a family, you may even be able to get Medicaid to pay for your private insurance plan which is great, it's a great deal. Um, so if you have specific questions about that, it's beyond the scope of our seminar, but I just want you to know about it. 
Um, and then, you know, that might be worth a follow-up. Um, how do you compare benefits in different states? Um, <clears throat> one place to start is each state has uh, what I used to chair here in New York, a developmental disability planning council. Oftentimes they will have a lot of resources on disability benefits in that state. So I would look up the Connecticut Developmental Disability Planning Council and get information on what, what services are offered. And then you could certainly in, in, in New York state, we have a fairly robust platform that, that um, you know, you can look up the OPWD benefits. But I think one of the problems is there's not a clearinghouse for here's every benefit that exists in like an a la carte menu. That doesn't exist because all these different systems have different silos and different points of entry. That's why selfishly we built a business helping people figure this out because it's, it's so hard. You can't just hop on a computer and say Connecticut benefits. Okay, here they all are. That doesn't exist. Um, what is a care coordinator? Doris, uh, a care coordinator, if someone is eligible for OPWDD or is interested, they can get connected with these organizations called care coordination organizations, which employ people that are in theory supposed to help you navigate this system. I say in theory because some are much better than others. You have ones that have been there for 30 years and they're veterans and they're great. And you have 22 year old people right out of college and they can't spell care coordination. So it's you know mix, mixed bag. The 529 fund is not gonna be used for college. What can be done with it? Elizabeth, that is a very specific tax question. So what I can tell you is if your child has a disability, you may be able to, may be able to roll that money into an ABLE account and then use it for anything for that child. It's very broad. Um, if the child has a qualifying disability, which means they meet the definition of disability through Social Security, you can actually take money out of the 529 plan and use it for a non-college expense and avoid the 10% penalty. However, you will be subject to income tax on the gain. Um, you could also go back to school, I suppose, yourself, or use it for other kids or grandkids. You know, those are some of your options. Can you charge for lodging if a child receives SSDI? Absolutely. Any child, you can, you can charge lodging. In fact, you should charge all your children for living with you. It's expensive out there. Uh, but in all seriousness, if you're on SSI, if you're on SSD, absolutely, you can charge your child for lodging. And what in doing so, if they're also applying for SNAP, that will allow them a greater SNAP benefit because by charging for lodging, they have less money available for food. Um, the child has no benefits yet at age 20, but we start soon. Can she still have received benefits if she attends an away college with accommodations? Absolutely. So Melanie, that's a great question because a lot of these systems, if your child is outside of high school, it doesn't matter that they're temporarily away at school. It's a temporary abs absence you can apply for benefits in your home state now and then just time it so that they're signing the forms when they're home. <laughs> so, cause you're not sending FedEx back and forth and stuff like that. But um, going to college is considered a temporary absence. And so you don't, if you get benefits and then go away to college, you don't lose benefits. They, they, they stay active. You're just temporarily out of the state. Um, so, so I would start the process now and, and uh, you should be good. Um, sorry, Tay has got a really long statement, which I appreciate. Um, oh, so for Summit Camp, if you have a special needs trust, you have an ABLE account, that's a textbook example of a distribution. So for any camp that would, it's literally, I think the example they use in the law. Uh, can they do access VR while still being self-directed? Absolutely. Those systems are not uh, mutually exclusive. So a great question. Can you repeat what I said about SNAP? So this was at 802. So I'm <laughs> just getting to 802 questions. What I said about SNAP is the way SNAP calculates their benefit is they look at someone's gross income. They subtract from that if they're paying rent. Then they subtract from that if they have out-of-pocket medical bills. And what's left can be spent on food. So if someone doesn't have a rent charge, but they've got social security and maybe they're working, in theory, all of their money could be spent on food. So the best way to get the maximum amount of SNAP is to say your child is paying rent plus utilities, because that further reduces how much they could spend on food. 
and then likely they'll get bumped up to $250. And the way you would make that change is, is you'd notify Snap that you're gonna do a Snap change and you tell them about the new situation. We know about self-direction in Vermont. We don't, Ina, I'm sorry. We don't know much about Vermont other than the Equinox Resort is really cool and I love skiing. That's all I've got. Um, what if the disabled person dies for the ABLE account? I'm really, it's unpleasant. Um, it depends which state you live in. Some states put a lien on the ABLE account to the, just like a self-settled or first party supplemental needs trust, and to the extent they have provided either social security or uh, Medicaid benefits, they would recruit back the dollars to the extent that they provided services. So if the person didn't get services for whatever reason, it would go to their heirs, whether if they had a will or if they didn't have a will, it would follow the intestate laws of that state, uh, which depend on the state. Um, so in New York, if you've received benefits, it goes back to the state. So. Personally, I don't get worried about that because one, if the child died and they've been receiving benefits, I guess I just don't feel bad that he paid for some of those benefits. But two, as long as it's not this tragic accident, if, if someone's getting sick, nothing to say you can't, I know this sounds terrible, but like go out in a blaze of glory. So like go to Disney, fly first class, buy gourmet food, just get the money out of there and have a great time if, if something was, you know, if your, your life is, 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 is not going so well medically, you know, blaze of glory. Um, I know that's not pleasant, but that's, that's the deal you make. Um, if you work, did you say you can put the income into an ABLE account and not have a deduction to the SSI for earned income? So, so that's, that's a little tricky. So, <clears throat> Without going down the rabbit hole, SSI waives the first $65 of earned income. After that, it's a two for one reduction. For every $2 of wages, you lose a dollar of income. So by funding the ABLE account, you don't change that relationship. All that you change is that the income that you're earning doesn't count towards the $2,000 asset limit. So once you've earned income and you stick it in your bank account, it becomes an asset. And SSI looks at both income and assets. So the use of the ABLE account is to shelter the, the asset once you've earned it so that you can go over and above the $2,000 limit. And can I, can I do that success story again for the person working with disability? So, so in New York and in many other states, there is a program called the Medicaid Buy-in for Working Persons with Disabilities. So if you're, you're working and you are labeled by the, either the state or the federal government as having a disability, you can earn significantly more money. Uh, in New York, it's 65,000. In many other states, it's around that. So you can earn that amount of money and keep your Medicaid. So you can actually earn more than that, but if you earn more than that, you have to put it into a trust. Um, and the neat thing also is in many states, retirement funds are exempt resources. So the example I gave is we have a client that earns 100 grand a year, she keeps 65, she puts the rest in her trust. She has over a million dollars in her 401k and she has Medicaid, she has self-direction, she has all these supports. So it's a perfect example of someone working, earning and saving while still maintaining all of these benefits. So that was that story. Um, whew, all right, I'm caught up, we got 11 minutes. Um, what are the rules about income and assets with Medicaid and SSI? So again, um, some of these are New York based. So SSI is a, a $2,000 asset limit. That's the same in every state, it's federal benefit. Some states operate off of the 2000 for Medicaid as well, like Florida. The rules for in Florida is you gotta have 2000 or less, but most states, especially almost all the New England states, um, it's a higher number, $16,800 is the amount of money you can have in your name and still have Medicaid. The income limit, also federal, $934, unless you're working, in which it's state specific again. So in New York, it's close to 65,000. Um, as I mentioned in that last story about the woman at Wegmans, if you're on the Medicaid buy-in in New York, you can have 20 grand of cash. 
unlimited personal assets. So you could have, we actually have a client that has an Andy Warhol painting and is on Medicaid and it's not considered an asset because it's a painting. Now, if he calls up Sotheby's and sells it, then it's an asset. But for now it's in a climate controlled vault and not an asset. Um, you can have unlimited retirement assets and you can have up to 65,000 in, in income on the Medicaid buy-in. So for, um, for either federal, uh, so in, in, in all states, but, but certainly in New York, um, if you, there's this thing called a Medicaid spend down. So sometimes people have too much income in order to get Medicaid. So that could happen if there's a situation of divorce and the child is 18. Um, and in New York now, child support goes until 26. So that income between 18 and 26 is income with respect to the child. So if the, uh, if the parent is paying a thousand bucks a month in, in child support, that income is gonna kick them off of benefits. So, so there are ways to shelter that income by using a trust. And so the uh, child support goes into the trust and the child reports zero, zero income. Um, I'm not gonna answer the rest of those, that, those bullet points because I'm just gonna take us down a rabbit hole bit and we're gonna run out of time. Uh, so there was a question from Doreen, is the asset benefit for SSD receivers still 15,000? So Doreen, just to be, I don't wanna split hairs, but if you're on social security disability, there is no asset limit. You could have a million dollars and be on social security disability because what social security disability is looking at is it's looking at your ability to earn income through employment. It's not looking at your assets. Medicaid, however, if you're interested in preserving Medicaid, Medicaid has asset limits. And in New York, it's $16,800, unless you're working, in which case it's 20,000. In both cases, retirement assets are exempt, special needs trusts are exempt, ABLE accounts are exempt, houses are exempt, personal, exempt, uh, personal belongings are exempt, and cars are exempt. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my next slide. Um, Something that no one asked, but I'm posing, um, is an ABLE account better than a special needs trust? So in my opinion, emphasis on opinion, ABLE accounts are better if someone is their own legal guardian, um, is working and wants to save, or if parents or grandparents wanna gift money to the child, uh, they're great tools. They're also great tools if you as a parent are financially supporting your child, and they're gonna apply for SSI and you wanna help them pay rent and food, if you pay their rent or pay for their food, they're gonna lose their SSI. However, if you fund their ABLE account and then use that ABLE account to pay their rent, to pay for food, they don't lose their SSI, so it's a loophole. A special needs trust is better for larger sums of money and in estate planning situations. So if you were to die and wanna leave your house to your child, you can't leave the house to the ABLE account unless your house is a tiny house worth $15,000 and you're gonna sell it. So, um, so typically special needs trusts are used uh, for estate planning, whereas ABLE accounts are used more for ongoing savings and, and financial support. Um, what assets can someone have and still be eligible for Medicaid? So uh, I've kind of said this a couple of times, they can have a house, they can have a car, they can have a prepaid burial account, they can have a retirement account, either 2,000, 16,800 or 20,000, depending on which type of Medicaid program they're on. You can have an ABLE account, you can have a special needs trust. So we have many clients that have lots of assets and are receiving all of these different benefits. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's a useful tool, but, but, but I think it's important to realize that you, you don't have to live in poverty to qualify for all these services. You just have to understand the rules of what you can and can't have. Um, should a trust own real estate for benefits of someone with intellectual or developmental disabilities? Um, that's a question that sometimes comes up a lot depending on the audience. Um, our opinion is yes, it can, but um, typically not if there's a mortgage outstanding because a lot of times banks don't wanna lend to trust. Um, and if you're gonna put a house into trust, you need to make sure there's enough cash to pay for the roof. Um, and the only other consideration is if the house is owned by your child's trust and they have a roommate, the roommate's gonna to need to pay rent to, to the trust. So a little bit more technical than I wanted to get into, but um, that's that. So a couple more questions coming in here, which is great. So it looks like there was a past lecture on ABLE accounts, which was, which was pretty cool. When you say special needs trust, are you assuming a revocable trust? So <clears throat> special needs trust by law are revocable in 100% of the, 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 the cases. 
Uh, a trust could either be contained within the body of your will, which means it's a testamentary trust, or it could be something that's created now. And for it to be a viable special needs trust under both federal law and state law, it needs to be revocable. So you can't, you can't change it. So Stephen, um, all special needs trusts by, by statute are revocable unless they're in a will, which means there's not really a trust set up yet because there's a will that creates a trust upon death. But after death, it, it would be irrevocable or irrevocable depending on where you went to school. Um, whew. I'm really sorry I didn't have the presentation up for the first part. I, I'm, I'm really embarrassed at that. So um, I'll go back to that one slide because I, I know this was a big one for a lot of people. So I have four more minutes before my son gets really upset that I didn't put him down for bed. So feel free to pepper me with a couple more questions and then I'll let you guys uh, let you guys go. And, oh, sorry, I lost the change screen. There's the chat box. No more questions. Is that that good? I don't know. You guys must be tired. Okay. Great. Well. If you have follow-up questions, um, can't promise that I'm gonna answer every single follow-up question depending on the nature, but if you ever wanted to speak further on a more professional basis, we are not a non-for-profit. You know, we do uh, charge clients depending on what capacity we're working with, um, how much do we charge for our services? So it, it really depends on what we're doing for someone. So most of the time we don't wanna do hourly work we do things where uh, you know the bulk of our work is uh, we figure out every benefit we can possibly get for a family and how to maximize them, how to set things up from a legal standpoint, how to set things up financially, and what's the long-term plan after someone passes away. So typically, you know, an engagement with us is about $3,900 and can go up from there depending on the complexity. So if someone says, they, hey, they wanna buy a house, they wanna rent it back to their child, and they're gonna do it with four other families, that's <laughs> it's a tremendous amount of work. We're actually doing that exact situation in Port Washington, Long Island right now. But, um, you know, that's obviously a very, very sophisticated technical plan. So that can be, that can get expensive. But uh, most families are spending, you know, three to four grand to build uh, a solid strategy for their family and acquire a lot of these benefits. So it doesn't work in every situation. And we don't take all clients because we, we want to be helpful. But what I'll tell you is if we're going to take someone on, it's typically we're going to be able to pay for ourselves in, in, in many times over by accessing benefits that you didn't even know existed. Um, if we think we can get you the benefits, and we'll, we'll tell you that. So um, that is that. So um, great. Um, and yeah, so I, I would say um, for us to be the best fit. And we typically are best for New York families because that's really where our expertise is. I know a lot about other benefits just because our clients have moved, but, but my, my core competency is New York. All right, I think that's it. I'm gonna stop sharing. Oop, you're still on mute. Okay, I'm getting two thumbs up. <laughs> still on mute. Oh, there you this go. This was uh, this was really helpful. Great. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, I, I wish you knew more about the New Jersey piece, but uh, I know. Uh, so, do do you have a uh, do you know of a resource or uh, uh, that I could find? Because this is the first time I've heard this. You know, you always listen into these in presentations. This is the first time I heard it to a level of detail that uh, I found way more helpful. Uh, what like some things on some gaps that you know my wife and I have yeah and just really interested in in trying to find a similar resource yeah in New, in New Jersey I, New I, Jersey. I I wish I wish I did you know there's not there's not a lot of great like forums for people in our line of work you know they do yeah. they do exist but I'm I'm not familiar with someone in New Jersey um Ann Phelan who was on the last one has us uh, as a referral to someone like me in Massachusetts. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm not a, I'm not aware of one in New Jersey. I'm sorry. Well, that's a person from Riverview, right? It is. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Well, uh, hey, man, this was really great. So much appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you.
Great yeah, day. no problem at all. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. Hey, I think you are still muted. I don't know how to unmute you. Oh, no. I have to plug in your microphone again. Now it says you're muted. Okay, now I just unplugged You're it. good. Oh, Thumbs up. Must have been the headphones. Yeah. Okay, well, we will wrap up. We don't want to take up any more of your precious, valuable time, but you have no idea how much this helped me understand the ins and outs of it. And, and like many parents said, it is a lot to digest, um, but that's why we have the recording. And we are so, so thankful for you to share your knowledge. Uh, hopefully you'll get some uh, clients out of this as well that need some extra, extra support. And yeah, I mean, I just, I just can't say how, how wonderful this was. 